Good to see everyone out tonight. If you will please pray with me. Dear Father, we are indeed grateful to be able to come together and study just a small portion of your word. We pray to God that as we look into your word, <clears throat> the things that have been spoken to us, the example that's been left for us through these words, we pray to God we'll try to model ourselves after citizens of your kingdom. We pray to God that as we continually apply those things to our lives, that others will see uh, your word living through us and we'll be curious and we could give an answer for the hope that lies within us. We know, dear God, that even though we strive to be as close to the example as we possibly can, we know many times we do falter. We know you're a loving God, a caring God, one that is just as quick to forgive as we are to repent. So we pray to God for the humbleness of mind that we would repent of those things that so easily entangle us. We thank you for the sacrifice of your Son, His willingness to die on behalf of our sins, and His willingness to obey you all the way to the point of death. We praise His name. We thank you so much for each other also, and us being able to lift each other up during the middle of this week. We pray to God that as we disperse out of here that we'll continually to continue to remember the things that's been spoken to us continue to apply them to our lives so that others may see in christ's name we pray amen, amen. all right going to turn to john chapter three that's where we will be our base text and we'll have another one coming up here shortly of course we've gone through we're going through the book of john john chapter one john chapter two uh, we've gone through some of the questions that just to kind of revisit a little bit, was uh, um, in John chapter 2 was the first time that we see uh, a miracle in public done um, by Jesus. And what was that miracle? Water. Wow. Yeah, turned the water into wine. He picked a, a wedding ceremony. Um, and we discussed a little bit about um, his, um, his discussion with his mom. And in uh, the third question I uh, asked was, John calls this miracle the first sign and reveal Jesus' glory. Where do you see Jesus' glory in this event? Of course, we discussed that. And so that question I wanted to kind of continue on because if the man is able to do miracles, one of the questions or one of the statements that Nicodemus makes in John chapter 3 is actually one of those things. And that is, you have to be of God because no one can do these things unless God is with him. Um, we also see that in um, John chapter 2 that there's some misunderstanding that uh, people have about Jesus and about some of the things that he says in John chapter 2 and verse 8, uh, verse 18, I'm sorry, verse 18. Um, what's the thing that Jesus is uh, misunderstood for saying? No. John, John 2. John 2. Yeah, to destroy the temple, and I'll raise it in three days. Now, later on, we see that, uh, and I tried to point out how that statement was such a pivotal statement because it continues to go through even after Jesus died, buried, resurrected again the third day. Then it came to light. And it was also one of the things while he was there on the cross that they mocked him with. So this statement was very powerful, and the people actually remembered it. It wasn't just the apostles that remembered it. It was the people that remembered it also while he was there on the cross. And so a lot of things are kind of going on here, and you can see how powerful these things are, and that continues over and spills on over into John chapter 3. All right, the first question I asked was, share a time when you were curious about something that you tried to learn as much about it as you could. Now, I don't know what your answer is, but it could be something like I was just really curious about um, this new skill and you just got all the information and in today's world it is very easy to get the information that you want it's as easy as well you guys could be cheating right now and looking things up right now just from the pew so we know that there's a lot of information about a lot of different things well we're going to see Nicodemus he's curious also if you will go ahead and turn to John chapter 3 and we'll go ahead and uh, start reading. I, I, we won't answer all of these questions that we have. I know there's quite a bit um, because I want to focus a lot on the, the first chapter here, or I'm sorry, the first part of John chapter 3 and the discussion between this born again. Go ahead. Um, did you uh, give us the questions for chapter 3? 
For chapter three, yes. Not chapter four, though. Everybody have it or? Did you have to read? Okay. You can make the copies of it. Sorry. Thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> it's okay because we're all script anyway. So, uh, the questions I, I will we'll ask general statements or general questions about um, in John three, but I'm going to ask very pointed questions tonight um, and discuss some things. But in John chapter 3, we do see there was a man of the Pharisees, and what was his name? It describes him a couple of ways. He's a Pharisee. His name is Nicodemus, and it calls him what? A ruler of the Jews. So this isn't just some guy that nobody knows. And one of the questions I ask is, why did he decide to visit Jesus? I, yeah, he was curious. To have a personal interview, evidently. Yeah, and I think that you know that he's probably curious, like the Bereans were curious. You know, in the fact that they want to know, they don't really care about all the noise that people are talking about. He's coming to Jesus to find out what does the man really say, because you ever played the telephone game, you know, and you try to, and then by the end, it's something completely different. Well. You know, I believe that's what's happening here with Nicodemus. He's curious about some of the teachings that's going on because there's already some question about the teaching, uh, about, you know, destroy this temple. Well, did he really say that? Does, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And did this miracle really happen? Because remember, it was kind of a closed type of situation. And so did that really happen? And I'm sure that he was curious to have that uh, one-on-one uh, conversation with Jesus. It also says, and it specifically says, that he come to Jesus how? When? At night. At night. Now, what does that mean? He doesn't want to be seen. Doesn't want to be seen. Could be he had a long day at work. I think specifically he didn't want to be seen or else it wouldn't have said by night. If it just that he had a long day at work, you know, it probably would have said something like that. But, you know, he's curious enough that um, he is at least going to come to Jesus, but at night. So that others, there's not really a whole lot of question about his loyalties to the Jewish religion. And I believe that has a lot to do with it. Because remember what he's called. He's called a ruler of the people. Now, if you see a ruler of the people going to this man, what's that going to mean? Yeah, everybody else is going to kind of follow along also. And he does, he's just curious. He doesn't really know yet. Go ahead. Well, I was thinking, how many times was it, has it been said that there were people that believed, but they didn't say anything because they were afraid they'd be... Pushed out of the synagogue. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He, you know, in all probability, he was thinking, hey, I need to find out about this guy before I make any kind of, you know, declaration because I don't want to get everybody mad at me for no reason. Exactly. And if you forward on to John chapter 12 and verse 42, uh, it says, nevertheless, all these things that were being done and, and said. It says in John chapter 12 and verse 42, Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities or the rulers, believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. So things, have, at least in John chapter 12, they had gotten to that point. Now, there's probably some discussion already that's starting to happen between the Pharisees and, you know, amongst themselves about who is this guy. And we're not too, too much into the, um, into the story yet. Go ahead. Some speculation that uh, Nicodemus may have been a member of the Sanhedrin. I, I don't know. It says he was a, of the Pharisees. You know, so so. That if, if he, you know, was that big a deal, then you know he definitely would have been cautious. Well, you know, and if we look up Nicodemus, he does show up a couple of times, specifically whenever they're ready to. Um, to um, go after Jesus, he says, now wait a minute, doesn't our law say that, you know, so he's at least has some influence over that. It could be that he was part, I don't know, it didn't say that, so we just no, have to kind of, no, we have to have speculation As on I that. As I said, it, it's just been, you know, maybe it just could have been, you know. Yeah. Um, and also Nicodemus comes at the very end also. His story doesn't end just with that either. 
Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. But um, we do know that he came to Jesus by night. And he says one thing, and we had listed in John chapter 2, or John 1 chapter, or John 1, John 2, where one of the uh, titles that was given to Jesus was rabbi, which means teacher. So he comes up to him, he's at least recognizing the authority that Jesus has in the fact that this carpenter is actually a teacher of the law. But he says, uh, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. Now, if we look at that statement, we know that you came. And we look at John chapter 12, verse 42, many of them believed, but they weren't going to say anything. So what has been the discussion that's been going on amongst the Pharisees? About this man, Jesus. Obviously, he, it's, they consider that he may be from God, that he does teach, right. you know, from the law and everything, and so, you know, they're kind of flummoxed. <laughs> yeah, you know, and I mean, again, they are, what they are doing is, what they are doing is they are questioning whether or not he is from God. But he makes this statement, we know you're from God. And he says exactly this, we know that you are God, that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Now, again, he makes that statement, but in the same vein, he's coming to him at night. So, this is a torn man. And I believe that's what we can see of Nicodemus. He's really wanting to, you know, really kind of uh, be a follower, I believe. But at the same time, I'm not really willing to give up everything that I, that I have currently. And isn't that how we are also? I mean, so it's, you know, it's easy for us to just say Nicodemus came at night. I wouldn't be embarrassed and all that. But we see that in ourselves as well with everything that we have to give up. And are we willing to give it up? Um, but uh, a couple of other notes. Um, in John chapter 9, you don't have to turn there, but in John chapter 9 and verse 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Now, Nicodemus has already said in John chapter 3 that the Pharisees know that he's from God, but later on in John chapter 9, they say, we don't know whether he's from God, but this is a public statement that they're making. So it's much different when you have that private one-on-one -on -one and in the public uh, and in the public eye. What can we learn about teaching in that? Thinking about if, if this is what you're asking, we can learn that what we teach is going to be heard and most often believed by people that trust you. Correct. Where yeah. the Pharisees were saying this thing that was false, and even though they may not have believed it, they were saying it. Yeah. People will people react one way whenever there's a public viewing, mm -hmm. in a completely different way whenever you're actually able to sit across the table from right. them and speak about the scriptures. And you know, Nicodemus is just a guy. I mean, and we ought to be able to see ourselves and others in Nicodemus because of that is the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm curious, I want to know more about it, but don't really want everybody else knowing because there's kind of this shame, I guess, or embarrassment to this. Um, and, but that's what we see out of, uh, out of Nicodemus. Um, uh, go ahead. The, the Pharisees, they were know-it-alls. I mean, they knew a little bit more about the Jewish religion than the normal person. Yeah, uh, Paul was a Pharisee of a Pharisee. Mm -hmm. you know, right? So they they were the elite of the Jewish the Pharisees. Yes. And Jesus challenged in a lot of their teachings, and obviously that's becoming true because he's curious. He's hearing something different than what he's always heard before. Anything else? Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, here early on, they're just trying to wrap their mind around exactly who yeah. is this individual. Part of this could be when Nicodemus states, we know that you're from God, that 
the, the things that he taught were more aligned with the Pharisees than they were with the Sadducees or, or other groups. You know, Paul used that advantage later on the resurrection of the dead to split those two groups from each other. And it could be early on here that they're saying, okay, we're just unsure about you. There's some things we hear that we like because you are strict in your teaching and they were relatively strict in your will. But then as you say, as time goes on, later they're like, we know Moses, but you... Um, no, because yeah, the more he taught, the more he pressed against their doctrines and traditions. Right. Well, and we see a challenge here to Nicodemus also in this discussion. This is a very brief discussion they have. I mean, it doesn't last very long, but there is so much into it, and it is a very heavy discussion. And those discussions, again, happen on a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and somebody who's very curious about what does God say about this. But he goes on to say... Uh, no one can do these th signs unless God is with him. Jesus answered said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, what does that mean about people who are not born again? He basically says it. You can't enter the kingdom. You can't enter the kingdom, but he says it even more, he cannot see the kingdom. And until someone is in the kingdom of God, it is very hard to perceive. Now, the Pharisees and, and everybody previous to that, what were they looking for? They were looking for the kingdom. We understand it's in the church. Well, they wouldn't have understood it's the church because they're looking for a kingdom. And what does that kind of bring mind to? There's this earthly throne, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So their preconceived ideas of what it ought to look like was what was clouding them. And until they entered into the kingdom, which is what it says... I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. We have a hard time whenever we're uh, talking to our family members or we're talking to uh, our friends or people of a, <clears throat> of, a, of a denomination. Why can they not see this? It's because they're not in the kingdom. They're, they haven't been born again. It, they can't see it. And so we have to understand that and we have to lead them into the kingdom and then all of a sudden it clicks and they can see it. Go ahead, John. Well, like the people nowadays, Nicodemus would have believed that he was already there because he was born of Abraham. He was part of God's chosen people. He, so this didn't make sense to him what Christ was saying, but Christ is able to skip over what Nicodemus said, didn't acknowledge it, but just basically told Nicodemus exactly what he needed to hear is, and that is, Nicodemus, you are not saved even though you and all your cohorts think that you're in the kingdom of God. You are not. Nicodemus didn't know what to do with that. He didn't. Right. It didn't make sense to him. He couldn't comprehend it. Yeah, and you know, when he says, Rabbi, we know that you're from God and all this, and it says, this is how Jesus answered him. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That's his answer to the statement that was made. So it's a very pointed statement, and like you said, it just gets right down to it about where Nicodemus is. As in a few cases before, Christ is able to see into his heart and see exactly what he's thinking, cuts, cuts everything away, and says what he needs to hear because of what is truly in his heart. Right. Now, what does this do to Nicodemus, though? This very upfront, in, you know, just very cut to the uh, point statement, what does it do to Nicodemus? Causes him to do what? what? I need more information. What are you talking about? I need more information about this because he's thinking that this kingdom is something that you can perceive, something that you can see, that it's going to be very visible. But Jesus just kind of completely undo, undoes all of that. Unless you were born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You cannot perceive it. It is, you know, and so... Nicodemus says to him, well, how can a man be born again when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born, can he? So was this a new concept that he had just heard? Yes. Obviously it was. Obviously it was. And so whenever he, um, when we know that because of the question, but the question that he asked shows something about Nicodemus also, is that he's kind of self-reflective and he wants to do what? He wants about this kingdom. What does he want? I'm all about it. I want to know 
I, I want to know about the kingdom of God. And if you're telling me, and I've just admitted that you're from God, and no one can do these signs except God is with him, so your teaching is obviously from God, then your statement about someone being born again, if they are not born again, they cannot see the kingdom of God, how do I do that? That's his question. How, explain this to me, please. And so it shows that his interest is in the kingdom of God, and also his interest also is, I may not be there because I'm not seeing the kingdom of God. So, you know, he's starting to kind of roll on this, this statement with this question. He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb, can he? And Jesus answered, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. Now, there we talk about the entering. It was two different words that he used there. First of all, if you're not in it, you can't see it. But in order to get into it, you have to be born of water and spirit. Now, for a long time, uh, and I still hear people today um, teach that this is teaching about water baptism. I do not believe that it is. Um, I believe he's just telling him it has to be of God. Um, the reason that I say that is because if you skip on down, Nicodemus in verse uh, 10, uh, Jesus answers and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? So he's kind of baffled as to how Nicodemus cannot understand what he's talking about. The only baptism that uh, Nicodemus would have been um, familiar with would have been what? The Red Sea. The Red Sea or John's baptism. And we know both of those are not being baptized for the remission of sins like what we read about in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. So Jesus should not have been perplexed that he wouldn't understand something that has not happened yet. Go ahead. I would disagree okay. with that. I kind of figured you would. Yeah. Um, Jesus is teaching and baptizing people as John was doing. And John's baptism was before the cross of Christ. But people who submitted to it and died before that time would have received the remission of their sins upon the death of Christ. Um, and here, he's explaining this is how you get into the kingdom. If you refuse either the baptism of John and or the baptism of Christ while they were on earth, you are not going to get into the kingdom. Correct. Now, when the apostles came along, if you then accepted their teaching, you would get into that kingdom. So either, either way you go, whether it's talking about John, or talking about Jesus, or what the apostles preached in the Great Commission, water baptism was essential. And as in Titus chapter 3, he talks about the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's the same concept of the Spirit teaching what you must do that it includes water baptism. Yes. Um, I agree with what it says about the water. I don't think it's physical water, though, and here's why. Because if you continue on in this discussion, uh, the discussion doesn't just stop right here. The discussion continues on about how the wind blows and all this kind of stuff. If you turn back to Ezekiel chapter 36, which is kind of the, the next base text I want to turn to and look at, he talks uh, about sprinkling with water, about cleansing Israel with water, and he also talks about uh, the, whenever the Spirit of God moves upon, uh, or how it moves. Uh, go ahead and turn to Ezekiel chapter 36. And to me, if Nicodemus was a teacher of the law, he would have understood Ezekiel 36 and uh, the beginning of Ezekiel chapter 37. In Ezekiel chapter 36, um, in verse, we'll start in verse uh, 28. You will live in the land that I give to your forefathers, so you will be my people. I will be your God. Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanliness, and I will call you for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you. I will multiply the fruit of the tree and produce of the field, so that you will not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am not doing this for your sake. 
declares the Lord God. Let it be known to you, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. The desolate land will be cultivated instead of being desolation in the sight of everyone who passes by. Then they will say, this desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden and the waste, desolate, and ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left around about you will know that I am the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and planted that which was desolate. I am the Lord, have spoken and will do it. Thus says the Lord God, this I will also let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. I will increase their men like a flock, like the flock of sacrifices, like the flock of Jerusalem during her appointed feast, so that the waste cities may be filled with flocks of men that they will know that I'm the Lord. So he's going to restore Israel and he's going to restore them for his namesake because they've made a mess of his name. And that's really kind of the discussion that, uh, that happens. Excuse me. <coughs> um, but if you back up, in part of that discussion of how he's going to do this, in verse 23, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all the lands, and I will bring you into your own land. The next verse, verse 25, says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will clean you from your filthiness and from all your idols. And um, so basically he's going to clean them and he talks about this water that he's going to use. Later on in the discussion of John, and there in John 3, he continues on in uh, Ezekiel chapter 37 when he says, uh, and if you understand the, what's being spoken of, it's the valley of, of dry bones where you had all these dry bones and um, he was told to prophesy, you know, are these uh, bones dead? Yeah, they're dead. Are they dry? Yeah, they're dry. And can you bring them a lot, uh, back to life? In verse, um, verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded, and as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling, the bones came together, bone to its bone, and I looked, and behold, sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. And then he goes on to say in verse 9, then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, Prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain, that they come to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. It seems to me that that discussion is happening in John chapter 3 in the fact that a person cannot enter into the kingdom of God. They are dead. They are as dry bones. They cannot enter into the kingdom of God until they are born again, just like these dry bones were brought back together. Um, but they cannot do that without water, and that is the cleansing that happens here in Ezekiel chapter 36, and the Spirit. So it, it is something that has to happen within themselves as well. Um, also, if you turn to John chapter 3, back to John chapter 3, that discussion that he has, uh, Jesus says, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. So if you're living in, in the world, you're living in the world. And then he says, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So we're talking about that being born again. In verse uh, 7, do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but it does not know where it comes from and where it is going, so just like everyone who is born of the Spirit. So what we see is this wind kind of comes through and uh, breathes breath upon these dry bones and is brought back. Now no one knows, perceives where it's coming from, but we just know the action that it takes and that is to bring to life dead bones. And, you know, and he says that's exactly the way this is. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear, you, you perceive that something's happening. But what does he say? But do not know where it comes from. And you don't even know where it's going. I take that to mean that these dry bones or these people who are going to be born into the kingdom of God, you have no clue who they are. If you look at who accepted Jesus, 
much more so than the Jews did, it would be the uh, Gentiles. And so for him to be able to understand that, and that is that the Gentiles would be the ones who actually received the Christ, would be very foreign to what Nicodemus was saying, or what Nicodemus thought, his preconceived idea of this kingdom. Uh, again, that's complete speculation, but to me, it fits more in line with why he's kind of surprised that Nicodemus doesn't understand this. Uh, I don't want to make it a point of contention, but you know, that's my understanding of Ezekiel chapter 36 and 37 is actually what's being discussed here, which is why he would be surprised. How can you be a teacher and not understand these things? I'll open up the discussion. Okay. Go ahead. First, first of all, I, I just want to clarify for everyone, you're not, definitely not denying baptism. No, not at all. Right. Not at all. You're just saying there's, you see an alternate explanation of what's going Correct. on here. Um, Ezekiel 36 and 37 is talking specifically about the restoration of the exiles. Ezekiel being an exile prophet. That, that's what that has application to, not really New Testament, what's unfolding here. So I, I don't see any direct connection between the two passages. The, the part about the wind goes where it wishes, the Lord's just taking a common everyday thing that they would see. You know, the wind blows, you can't see air. You don't know really what you see the evidence of it. You see the evidence Correct. of it. And you'll see the evidence of the working of the Spirit. It's like when they asked him about the kingdom in Luke 17, he said, the kingdom's within you. You're, you're not going to see that. As I think you mentioned before, it's a spiritual thing. So you won't see that physical kingdom. Right. Um, and so he's pointing to that. In Romans chapter 6, where it's talking about being baptized into Christ, being baptized into his death, you're raised up to walk in newness of life. And so there is a definite connection throughout the New Testament, baptism, being born again, that those two go together. They're um, simultaneous. Right, and, that, and that's taught in Romans chapter 6 as well. Whenever you, you leave the old man and you come up out of the water a, a new man, um, and, I, and I do not, again, I want to stress the fact, I'm not saying you ought to be baptized. Right. What I'm saying is whenever we're talking about the water, I think there are, even in the New Testament, like uh, I just kind of looked up the word water just to kind of see where it showed up. And one of them that kind of caught my attention was Hebrews 10 and verse 22, where it says, let us draw near to God with a good conscience, with full of assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So... Either that's talking about a physical, uh, pure water, or it's talking about how God actually is using that symbolically. It's, Go ahead. And there in Hebrews 10, it is talking about physical water. You back up into chapter 9 and following, he had already referenced about how under the law they had the ashes of a heifer sprinkled with the hyssop and stuff, and he, this, they sprinkled the people and so there was, there was a sacrifice that was meshed in with the actual water and compound that he sprinkled on the people. Then he comes back and says, we don't have that, but we're washed in pure water. The sprinkling is like Peter talks about having a heart sprinkled that is sprinkled with the blood of Christ. Correct. And, and that's, that's and talked that about in, in Hebrews, Hebrews, correct. Yes. Right. Yes, and that's talked about in Hebrews as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and whenever, there, there were others that I kind of lose, so I'm like, okay, obviously that is talking about water baptism. Um, but with this one, um, in John chapter 3, I'm going to kind of stand on my Ezekiel 36 and 37 understanding. But uh, again, I, I'm not at all saying you don't need to be baptized into water um, for the remission of your sins. Because that is clearly taught and clearly observed in the New Testament, specifically after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Um, you know, even the question about uh, with John's baptism, even if Nicodemus was uh, familiar with it, we do see later on that that baptism is kind of null and void. You can't continue to teach the John's baptism because Paul taught you can't do that. You've got to be rebaptized in the name of Jesus or by his authority. And so um, whether or not it's being discussed here, um, I, I don't, I'm not that convinced that 
water baptism, that what we talk about in New, the New Testament water baptism uh, pre, or after um, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is being discussed here, I'm not that convinced, but I'm certainly not going to make it a, a point of contention. Right. So well, go ahead. One more footnote. Go ahead. Just to check out. When, when they asked him, when they asked John about, you know, are you the Christ? Mm -hmm. uh, are you Elijah? And they come back in John 1, 25, when he said, no, I'm not him, they asked him, why did you baptize if you were not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? So I would submit to you, the Jewish rulers... They probably were looking for that. They, they understood that baptism in some way was related to Elijah, which was, of course, John, but it's, that's another discussion about how the concept of it here. You know, they understood it had something to do with the Christ, and... And I would take that closer context with John 3 versus something in Ezekiel. Okay. Anything else? Go ahead, Paul. Uh, all that is necessary, but we haven't got, the scriptures haven't got to where our minds is. You know, Paul. Being struck a line and three days fasting, it took him a while to get to this. Now this is a personal conversation right here, just one on one. This Pharisee thing, I mean, they were really that was that was I mean that was the problem that Jesus had. These Pharisees was holding to that law that never was meant to be. <clears throat> well, they were holding the preconceived ideas, uh, just like many of us do as well. Yeah. And because of those preconceived ideas, it's very hard to understand some of the teachings. And they, they had elevated their belief. Correct. Were, uh, okay. Yeah. Now, I believe that what we need to understand the reason is. Now, um, again, the personal discussion that's happening here between Nicodemus is obviously causing Nicodemus to question some things about the kingdom and his idea of the kingdom, his idea of how to get into the kingdom, and also his idea of uh, there's, because uh, we see that there, uh, this discussion that he has with his misunderstanding of what Jesus just said. And uh, again, you know, Jesus is kind of baffled as to how he can't understand what he just said. Now, we have the advantage of we can say, well, let's turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. You know, we kind of have that advantage of the future of Nicodemus, and we can kind of look back and say, well, he's a teacher of the law. How could he not get it? You know, but understanding what, what Nicodemus would have known, what he would have been looking for, uh, his uh, idea of who the Christ was, you know, probably played a lot into this conversation. And a lot's not stated for us. Like I said, it's, it is a very short conversation, but obviously a very heavy conversation because we're talking about one being born again, one being able to see the kingdom, one being able to be inside the kingdom, and something that was so bizarre to a Pharisee that he just couldn't get his mind wrapped around it. And we're talking about a teacher of the law, one that should have known. All right, so... Um, in verse uh, 7 he says do not be amazed that I said to you must be born again so don't, don't be clouded by that and then the wind blows where it wishes you hear the sound but do not know where it comes from and where it's going so is everyone who is born of the spirit and again when we're talking about born you, if you look up that word born you're going to see that a lot just in this discussion that we just had you've got to be born again you've got to be born of the water and the spirit you have to be born of the spirit here um, in, in this also then Nicodemus says to him, uh, you know, how can these things be? He's really not understanding what Jesus is talking about here. And so that's when Jesus makes this statement. Jesus said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we've seen, and you do not accept our testimony. And here's why. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? So he's trying to talk to him in a, in a way that Nicodemus can kind of understand, and he's still not getting it. He's like, I can't even go to the next level because you aren't getting this. I mean, I can't 
talk to you about heavenly things. You're not even accepting our testimony. You know, maybe that's a kind of a, why are you coming to me at night? <laughs> you know, I got disciples that accepted straight off. And you're not believing our testimony, the things that we see, the things that we hear, the things that we are accomplishing. Is it not enough? And, um, but then he goes on to say, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the son of man. As Moses was lifted up in the, in the, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. So whoever believes in Him will have eternal life. Now, whenever we um, read that, we know that it's referencing what? What story? Verse 21. Yeah, Numbers 21, where Moses lifts up that um, that bronze uh, serpent, and what did they have to do so they wouldn't die? Had to, had to look upon it. And so he's referencing the Old Testament here and saying I'm basically the fulfillment of that. And we also know that Jesus didn't come to destroy the old law or what the prophets said, but came to fulfill them. And that I am the fulfillment of that. And so when we see uh, him say this, um, he makes that, that other parenthetical statement. So, in verse... Uh, 15, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. So it is the only place that you can look to in order to have eternal life. There's no other way to, to, to get eternal life. Now, with this discussion of eternal life and what were they just talking about? Being born again into what? Being born again in the Spirit, but in getting into what? Kingdom into the kingdom of God. And so now it's like he almost switches gears, but he really doesn't, does he? He's talking about the exact same thing. So being in the kingdom of God is what? Leading to eternal life. You are looking unto Jesus for eternal life. And uh, again, Nicodemus... You, you can see the confusion that he's having and Jesus is trying to explain. He's going back to the Old Testament. He's trying to explain to him what he's, what he's talking about and yet um, we just never really kind of come to a conclusion whether or not Nicodemus gets this or not. Now, some scholars have said uh, verses 16 through 21 um, is not Jesus stating these statements, but they are John the, the writer making these statements. And I kind of agree with that because if you go back to John 1, he starts to kind of repeat some of the things that we read in John chapter 1. It's neither here nor there. It's still inspired. Um, but a lot of people will still have it in red in their, in their uh, Bibles. Um, and if you read that, it does kind of break away from the discussion that's happening. Um, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son to the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has, not, has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Now, that to me, whether you believe Jesus or John wrote it, to me, that whole statement has to be taken as the complete statement, not just one part of it. And what part am I usually talking, am I talking about that's usually taken by itself? John chapter 3 and verse 16, and what's taught? What is your if you believe you're saved, well, it just so happens we agree with that. However, you've got to be able to qualify what that belief is. Because as the thought continues on and it progresses, we see something about these believers. And what do these believers do? They go where? Well, they go to baptism, but they, they go to where the light is. And it goes on to say... Everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds may be exposed. But he who does what? Verse 21. Comes to the light, practices the truth, and actually doing what is being stated by the light, 
has been um, so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And so that whole that whole scenario there, or that whole statement, has to be taken for everything that it's worth, and that is it is a complete thought from 16 to 21. Now, the thought starts in verse 16 because he says the word for. So if Jesus was the one uh, making the statement, he's saying because of what I just stated. If it was John making the statement, then it's just John saying because of the um, conversation that just transpired, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should, be, um, should not perish but have eternal life. But if you turn back to John chapter 1, you will see that word or that, that idea of this light in verse, um, in verse 6, there came a man sent from God whose name was John. I'm sorry, um, back up to verse uh, 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. If you skip on down to verse 9, there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man which was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own. Those who uh, were his own did not receive him, but as many received him, he gave them the right to become the children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So we see that whole idea of light and being born of that being played out in this discussion in John chapter 3 after John's already stated it in John chapter 1. So like I said, we're, it continues to kind of cycle back around. Um, <clears throat> any discussion on that? I would link with you 16 to 21 as the Apostle John's commentary on what's above. It, it right. fits with that. He's almost like giving a recap, summary, application. Yeah, to me it's kind of a summary of what just happened or a reiteration of what just happened or what was being discussed. And again, uh, when, you, when you match it up to John chapter 1, it's almost hand in hand with John chapter 1 as well, talking about being born of God and then also the light. And I also believe that John uh, chose this very thing because of the discussion in John chapter 1. He's trying to prove that Jesus was the light, that Jesus taught that you had to be born of God, and here's how this was the discussion that happened between Jesus and Nicodemus discussing that very thing. Anything else? All right, we're very quickly running out of time, so let's go ahead and move on into uh, verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them, and he was baptizing. And that was to your, to your reference that you uh, mentioned uh, earlier, Stephen. John was also baptized in Enon near Salem because there was much water there, and people were coming and were being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. So in this commentary that John is saying is that there's an expectation. Everybody already knows John is going to be thrown into prison. He's just saying this is previous to that. Verse 25, therefore arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about uh, purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom uh, you have testified, behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. John answered and said, a man cannot receive anything unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I did say, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who is the bride is the bridegroom but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because the bridegroom's voice, so this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. And so these statements that are being made by John is because of a discussion about, well, they're baptizing over there also. Why are they baptizing? And John reiterates the fact, John the Baptist reiterates the fact that he is not what? Christ. I am not the Christ. You yourselves know I've said this. So then he, this whole discussion is about who? Who's the question about? About Jesus and his disciples over here doing the same thing that we are. 
So, and he says, hey, I'm not. But he goes on to say that he's excited because he understands what's happening. In verse, he gives the illustration of the bride, um, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, well, is he just mud? <laughs> no, I mean, he's excited for the bridegroom. And so he kind of understands a little bit about what's going on, but he makes this statement at the very end, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so whenever he says he, who's he talking about? Christ. That was the question that they had. So they clearly know at this point that John the Baptist is saying, that's the Christ, I'm not, I have prepared the way, it's time for me to start to bow out of the story. All right, verse 31. Again, you could say this is kind of a, you know, John the writer kind of stepping back in and uh, being the narrator. He who comes above, from above, is above all, and he who is the earth is, the, is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he who gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the, Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. So this statement again is being made, um, and it almost seems a lot like what we just read in John chapter uh, 3, verse 16 through 21. Uh, whenever it comes to this idea of believing and obeying because that's exactly what he says and those are two different Greek words. The King James will put both of them as belief in verse 36. He who believes in the Son, of, uh, in the Son has eternal life but he who does not believe the Son will not see life. Those are two completely different Greek words though and the newer translations correctly translate it as obey in the second one. So what does that mean about belief? It is obedience. It is something you must do. It's not just the mental ascension that many people believe is being taught there in John chapter 3, uh, 3 verse 16. So all of this, the whole chapter goes hand in hand with this uh, idea of who Christ is of you know the the questions that the Pharisees have of him, specifically of uh, Nicodemus, uh, some of the discussion about the kingdom, how to get into the kingdom, uh, some of the discussion about um, you know uh, who Christ is, what his purpose is, um, and all of that's uh, being discussed here also. In verse 36, to me, when it's translated correctly out of the Greek, the way that it's supposed to, is certainly teaching that belief and work go hand in hand, that they are one and the same. We see that throughout the scriptures. There is no scripture that is ever taught that says all you have to do is have a mental ascension, um, that Jesus is the Christ. That's all you got to do. Um, so, you know, as we continue on, I want to continue to stress that point because if you study with your friends out of denominations uh, with the book of John, they're going to tell you that word belief shows up throughout. You have to understand what that definition is. And there it's clearly defined for us in verse 36. If you believe in the Son, you have eternal life. But if you don't obey, you do not have eternal life. They are interchangeable with each other. Go ahead, Yogi. Yeah, Mike, um, I was going to ask you because I was thinking when I believe and we come out of the nation, I was explain very well by saying that, you know, even the demons confessed Christ, they didn't at one point of belief, right? So belief is like, they knew that he was the Christ but somehow. Yeah, you could, you could look in the book of James as well, you know, it talks a lot about belief and faith and works and what all that is, and even talks about the faith of demons in there, and, um, you know, so, but there is nowhere that I know of that teaches that faith is simply a mental note that you take. It is always in, in accordance with 
the obedience to being obedient to God and that that faith is actually shown or manifested through the works that you do. Um, and I, and I want to stress, I'm not saying that we are saved because we work, but we are saved because God has placed works in there for us to obey. And it's those works in which we, we have to walk in. Go ahead, Nancy. Well, he introduces that idea back in verse 14. When Moses put the serpent up on the pole, mm -hmm. they could believe that that would keep them from dying, but they had to do something. Yeah. So it introduces the idea that faith causes action. Correct. You know, and, I, and I've often wondered how many people died just because they wouldn't look at the snake. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and we'll see that here because we see just as he was lifted up, and later on in the story of John, Christ certainly is lifted up. Not all believed. Go ahead, Clint. Romans chapter 4 talks a lot about this too, with, uh, using Abraham as an example. In uh, verse 3, it says, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And, you know, later on, it goes on to say, Well, he was justified because he obeyed. Right. And he believed him, and that belief induced action. Yeah, and we read that also in James as well. You know, that it talks about Abraham and his faith as well. You know, at what point do you say that Abraham believed? Or was that the point of obedience that you say he believed? Go ahead. Simple point. Uh, those who want to use uh, terror at Mark 16, the end of that, the actual words there will say you have the two different versions, uh, one is uh, disobeying, one is... Yeah, and yeah. 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 Mark 16, yeah, exactly. Uh, and when we get into John chapter 5, we're, I'm going to go back to Mark 16, 16, because uh, a lot of people believe that the two things that are mentioned there in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall not be saved, that therefore baptism is not essential. When you read John chapter 5, it is the same sentence structure. The exact same as Mark 16, 16, and it is all throughout John chapter 5. And so we'll go over that uh, as well when we get there. All right, anything else? All right, I'll go ahead and close out the class then.